Now, what was it like? I always ask, I ask my guests this sometimes, especially if there's been that moment, that moment that kind of really explodes them in town. What is it like being the bell of the ball? Because I remember Robin Hood, when that came out, that was a monster hit. It was a very, very large hit for both Kevin. I mean, Kevin was on a, that was, that was his peak time. He dances with wolves. So we were getting enormous amount Field of, of dreams. Yeah. Getting terrible reviews. Oh, yeah. Um, my, yeah, remember, my son was with us in New York and he said, why do these people hate you, Dad? Because the reviews in the New York Times are horrible. But, you know, the, the thing, you know, time, time heals all wounds. Um, <laughs> and no one remembers critics. So, you know, in a way, you can't judge what you've achieved except, and that comes back to this thing, do what you do, do it to the best of your skill level. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let, let time be the judge of it. But if you don't, and I, when I say write, create, think, um, you don't do it to the point where it's dangerous, which means you're going against the conventions. You're going mm -hmm. against them. You're taking it. You're not going to find your voice. You're not going to be the significant person that everybody says, well, I want a film like his because he's got a voice. And we, those films stick out with novelty and originality, but they're still going to follow the same footsteps of any good story, but they will be in, in, in a fresh way. So we get um, Robin Hood. We get some doors opened up. But we also get asked to do every bow and arrow film in the world. Oh, and we, of course. We, um, <laughs> and then we find there are films that um, the system is not, uh, it, it's, you got to love it and you can't get it, let it get you down. But I spent uh, time uh, with Mark Stern actually helping me with my, my, my writing assistant on that project. I spent time with Arnold Schwarzenegger working on Gulliver's Travels for Disney. Spent like 18 months. Wow. The head of Disney at that time goes, you know, it's a really good script. I don't know why I'm not going to make it. And, had, goes, and, and had Arnold attached. Yes. Ar so Arnold in the 90s, which arguably he was still one of the biggest movie stars in the world at the time. So, and, <laughs> Jesus. But, but, but you see, this is normal. Um, and we've gone through dozens and dozens of steps. And you realize that the logistics of this are not one-offs. They survive long enough with keep trying to present the things you care about so that you're willing to take the risks of exposing yourself to try and get them to become reality. And if you don't care about what you've done, which goes back to don't just do something because you think it will sell, you're not going to keep going through the years and years. Now, we'll, we'll talk about Harriet Tubman briefly. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, for everybody to know, when we're recording this, Harriet just came out the weekend prior and it did it, it, the gangbusters. I mean, people were like, it really overperformed. So please tell us how you're involved with that. Much more than anybody anticipated, which is wonderful. Harriet Tubman, I discovered as an Englishman listening to a, a quiz show, um, which asked what, what woman wearing American uniform went into battle and soldier. And I go, that sounds interesting. It's the only woman ever. And I, and I go and start researching the answer, which is Harriet Tubman and find this extraordinary, mythic, incredible, altruistic heroine. And, and it appeals to me very much to make films which have got a reinforcement of human nature. Um, we managed to get um, Disney, which was Hollywood Pictures at that time, to write a script with Gregory Allen Howard, who was one of the producers and one of the writers on the, 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 the Harriet. And we got three drafts out, and we couldn't get it made. Um, Later on, we were approached by uh, people who had picked up the baton and proud to say we did not stand in the way. We said, take the project, did not charge them money for it, and said, just let us stay involved in some way. Give us a credit if that's comfortable for you. Um, but God bless you. Go out and get it made because her story is much more important than us having uh, you know, money in exchange for it. There are things that you... You just think uh, America needs that story. Mm -hmm. And so um, then the producers on the movie um, who took the, up the challenge, you know, they go through fire and they got through fire and they ended up with a beautiful film, a, a wonderful human statement, a moral purpose that I am so proud to be associated with. But all I did was plant the seed. And you, when did you start that journey? 90. Correct. So I can only imagine trying to get the, her and, the her and heritage. 94 when, and 94 when we sold 
uh, Greg Allen Howard getting it written. So even there was four years of trying to get that. And 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 during the '90s, this was not going to happen. Like there was just I don't think it would have been very difficult in that environment. I mean, in today's world, it's a it's it's tough, but it, there is an yeah. opening for that. There's a conversation about about minorities and about other you know, other other stories that need to be told from different perspectives and so on. Back then, it would have been very difficult. Like I'm just trying to think of the Hollywood Pictures logo coming up. Yeah. With that movie, I'm like, mm, in the I 90s. Always have, I, I, I'm an optimist, so you never know. I mean, that, that, <laughs> that's the thing. you got to go. you got to no, go. you got to try. No, and, you... and the beauty of it is um, it, 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 it takes a team. I, was, I, I may have you know, blown up the football at the beginning, <laughs> but they went out right. and played the game. <laughs> right. So um, it takes a team. We're, we chose a very difficult business. No, and it, it is, and it's, and I always tell people we we've our our paintbrush and canvas is probably the one of the most expensive on the planet, you know, to play with. I mean, other than architecture, I think I always say is like as far as an art form is concerned, this is probably one of the most expensive art forms there is. And as filmmakers and as creatives, we have to take some physical responsibility with the money that we're given, um, right. or that we spend on this on these on this pro on this process where I just love when filmmakers who've never made a movie ever and by the way I put myself in this category because I said the exact same thing when I first started all I need is three million all I need is five million at five million I can make it's nothing it's five million it's not that big a deal the last movie was made for 200 million and Marvel spending five million on coffee it you know and that's all fine yeah. and did right that, that I've heard this I'm sure you've heard this a million times anyone listening out there no <laughs> it doesn't work that way yeah there's some outliers of course that have that you know they make their their indie movie and then are given a marvel movie or given a big studio movie or something like that but they're outliers it's not the way the business works is that fair to say well you, you can create your own business if you're able to uh, have enough guts or enough partners who are helping you mm -hmm. um I, I do think that the movie business as you've been asking is is changing, but I can't tell you how it's changing. Where's the where? Where would you put your energy right now to try and get movies made? Um, I think that you know the Apples and the Netflixes are still not accepting independent films. Until you've succeeded, then they'll cherry pick you. So your your goal is to try and get something out that gets viral, that gets emotional responses, that gets you to uh, be noticed in. Uh, legitimate awards because I think there's a lot of awards com uh, groups that are out there yeah. um, that may not be actually giving you a uh, status whereas the Nichols or Final Draft or the Austin are very sincere very real judgments on your work mm -hmm. um, and if you if you get uh, and you got to fight for these things and and, that, and and it's hard frightening demoralizing and therefore that's why I keep coming back to if you have a personal philosophy and you're pursuing it, nothing you do is wasted. Every element that you write, even if that movie doesn't get made, adds to your ability, it's like muscle development, it adds to your ability to the next time you write. And I've seen myself write out of sheer passion when I suddenly hit the click moment, when it's ripe. And I was talking with another young writer yesterday, I'm talking about exactly the same thing. We tend to write a form that is our nature, it comes out of our subconscious. What you're really trying to do is to get it out of your subconscious. And I have tools for that. One of my tools is to look at the process like a Lewis and Clark expedition. Any freaking way to the coast is legitimate. <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> you, you've never been there before. How the how can you critique the journey? No, and, but and go ahead, go ahead. once you get there, the brilliant thing is just get to the end. Because just get uh, any way you can get to the end. And if necessary, I write bits. So I might have an ending and then get to the, I might have a middle and an end. Um, I don't write in a linear form. I write whatever way it comes to me and I'm grateful for it. Once you get to the end, then you get to see what you've created. And you see what you've actually subconsciously been given to yourself. And sometimes it's like dictation out of God. You know, you just don't know why you're getting it. But if you question it, you screw yourself. So there's a net, there's a nag in your head that's going to piece of shit. It's all a waste of time. No one's going to like it. That nag has nothing to be objective about. What it's doing is it's just trying to prevent you from going into a dark cave. And it's helpful when it's doing that, but it's not helpful when you're writing something you've never written before. So you've got to ignore the nag. And then you write down this stuff 
and you get to the end and then you take a giant celebratory sigh because that's a monumental achievement to get to the end of anything creatively. Mm -hmm. And then you get the permission to look at it and see why you really wrote it. And now, now you have this opportunity to see what it says to you. And it didn't exist before. So now you're, you, you can make a judgment call. And I call that putting the freeway through. And what you're doing is you cleave off all the things you don't need. You combine two characters so they become one. You, you essentially now know why you and how you want to go and why you're getting there. And then you put up the freeway sign so that everybody else can follow you. But you don't do that as one thing. You don't write, I got to be perfect, got to get it out of me, and I got to write it so it can be a hit. No, you just get it out of you and then tune it. And then retune it once you've had people read it so that you make sure that the people who are reading it understand what your goals were. And don't, don't just have an, a, an ego snip and say, oh, that's obvious, they should know. No, if you're going to do that, then you're just damning yourself because you will find that most people don't know. They don't have the time to read. They read very badly. Or they give it to somebody who does coverages, who's paid 50 bucks to read it in a hurry. And so the more powerful you can make the statement and not allow it to be misunderstood, the more chance you have of selling it. 